uh, welcome, uh, David. Thank you. It's nice to be here. It's great to have you here. Um, let's start with a practical example of what your company does and what your role, which has a super cool title, is. Yeah, so we're a, a data science platform that makes it easier for data scientists to produce data science products. So a data science project is um, code and data, but a data science product is something that reaches the hands of the end users in a way that helps them transform the way that their business operates. Um, so my role title is data science evangelist, which in a way kind of is going out and talking about what we do and thinking about um, how we create awareness for the platform, how we talk about use cases and things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, so one of the key factors of Domino Data Lab is we're a system of record that allows you to track all of the little decisions and assumptions and actions that you take when you're designing one of these models. And that becomes important because one of the things as we'll talk about is the need to explain these models and to make them uh, understandable that when we're talking to other people, we can kind of demonstrate what they do and how they do it. And tell me, what differentiates you from Palantir? So Palantir is more of an organization that focuses on very defined use cases in the uh, field of security and looking at uh, uh, personal information and other information sources to help in crime fighting and profiling of, uh, I guess, different events. Um, we as a company are a platform that works across many different industries. So we have uh, people in the uh, medical sector, we have people in financial services, and we have people in things like manufacturing lines. So we're more of a, a platform that allows companies to leverage AI technologies and ML technologies, and we help them with co collaboration across wider teams. Um, whereas Palantir, I would say, is more an application design for a particular use case. AI is a ubiquitous in our lives. What trends are you seeing? Um, in which industries is AI advancing? I'm not uh, interested in uh, chatbots, virtual assistants, autonomous vehicles, but more to, I'm interested in uh, um, non-visible AI powered solutions such as quality control, manufacturing, uh, office processes, optimization. We're actually in the age of algorithms. So I think in all industries and across pretty much every um, use case, we're seeing a rise of algorithms being utilized. And some of the factors behind that is that the algorithms or these mathematical functions that we use to do things like classification or a prediction of an event occurring are much easier to apply and much more powerful than ever before. We've also seen a lot more sensors. So all of us carry smartphones around now, which means we're constantly recording and capturing this information around us. So when you sort of correlate those two things together with the ability to put sensors pretty much on any device, um, the algorithms that are easier to uh, utilize and the more data that we're collecting, you have these really interesting fringe use cases like um, on train systems, analyzing the vibrations of a part and working out that there's a subpart within that train system that if you maintained it overnight, you're going to avoid any outages and you're not going to have a big uh, repair bill when you're actually trying to replace the entire part. So that's a case where you're listening to sort of sound vibrations and the frequency of these vibrations through a sensor using AI models to kind of go into that and figure out which part of that uh, big part is actually not performing the way it should. And the other area that they're really synonymous now is you think about the fitness industry and the amount of information we record on our athletes. So things like the way in which recovery works with heart rate variability. So we're better able to help power people through their types of athletic performance and let them know when it's either something that's not quite functioning in their body versus something they just need to push through. So you've seen higher peaks of performance. And that, again, is made possible by more information and more smart sensors than we've ever had before, but much more awareness of how to apply these algorithms in the real world and then real-time feedback because we've got these digital interfaces. So because of that, there's, there's a broad use of use cases that aren't just your normal chatbot to autonomous vehicles. It can relate to all sorts of different industries, and I think it's very uh, exciting to be a part of that. David, COVID has impacted the businesses basically everywhere. Um, how can AI help them in forecasting the demand and therefore adjust inventories, supply chain, and even logistics? It's actually a really interesting question because in many cases, companies that were utilizing models and algorithms were kind of caught out by uh, what COVID brought. 
So if you think of COVID as a black swan event where um, things that were occurring had not really seen been seen inside these industries before. So these models were kind of caught out because they weren't able to work on the basis of the latest three weeks of information. So if you think of retail stores or you think of other businesses where their supply chain was being predicated on what was previously there, a lot of them didn't have the models that they thought they had around sort of reinforcement learning and approaches to mean that when an event changes or there's massive drift in the data set that you're utilizing, that the model changes subsequently. And um, that's an area we've really focused on. We have a product called Model Monitoring, which looks at all of these different data sets as they occur and helps people understand that there's this massive change in, in things that have gone on. And that means that they can kind of position their models in a way or position their workforce in a different way to either take advantage or lower the risks. I think some of the um, interesting areas in COVID is that data scientists and AI is very much leading the way in terms of the research. So we're talking about... Uh, vaccinations potentially being available in the next six to 12 months. And if you look at the timescale of vaccinations previously, that would have been unthinkable. And one of the reasons there is we're able to use things like synthetic data and, and simulations of what these tests are to go through a lot more uh, large scale testing of things like vaccinations and their impacts than what we would have been able to do during normal trials. So when you think about the, the potential for AI to transform the world, you look at COVID, that's a really good point around the acceleration that they're able to do in the research elements and the scientific elements to bring us a vaccine hopefully much quicker. You started in the medical field as a, a software engineering. What can you tell us about the AI um, applications in that field? So there's um, a number of different things in the diagnostic space, which is using things like image recognition and image classification. So um, in about 2016-17, we reached a point where computers and computer vision were actually more accurate at diagnosing certain images than what humans were. Humans had about a 5% um, error ratio and machines got to about a 4% error ratio. So if you start to think of that in terms of MRI imaging or radiology or cancer detection, there's a lot of forefront images, which means we're able to detect the signs of things much earlier. And we're actually able to offer mass scale uh, diagnosis because in the past we were kind of limited on having someone that was a specialist be able to review these images. Now we can build these models which can uh, sort of multiply in real time and have as many of these sort of diagnosis scans going on at one time. So the ability for us to have a look at these images and get more out of them is starting to increase. And then if I uh, bring it back to those smart sensors, now if you think about the in-home measurements of where you're going with your devices, uh, patients are much able, uh, much more able to share information with their doctors and much more able to look at things from a holistic perspective of medicine. So not just a case of, am, am I taking my medication? Am I doing my uh, checkups? But also you set a care plan around certain exercises or certain amounts of walking, um, or I needed to keep my cholesterol down a little bit lower. These types of sensors are starting to become quite synonymous at the in-home uh, level. And what that means is we're seeing a lot more sort of events be done uh, preventatively of uh, medicine, so less about the hospitalization event, but more about what can you do to sort of increase your health overall. So doctors are pairing with these technologies more and more, so the, uh, the potential for this is quite huge, where we're going to see a lot more diagnostic medicine be capable through these devices that you might have in their home, which then frees up our doctors to be more focused on these uh, more important and more urgent use cases, such as our COVID diagnosis. David, you seem quite excited about the use of generative adversarial networks. For those who are not familiar, just Google the website. This person does not exist to have an idea of what image generation is, which is promising, but at the same time, very scary. What is your comment on this? It's definitely very scary. Um, if you think of things like deep fake, where now we're able to superimpose someone's face on top of a pre-recorded uh, video and have them almost sing or dance or say things, and we're able to now to generate voices in the same way, the implications of that are going to be quite massive if we're not able to distinguish the difference between something that's generated and something that's real. Unfortunately, the use of generational adversarial networks now is that we can actually look at these images and work out they've been generated. Um, the area that really excites me is I've always been into sports and one of the things about sports is you like to compare um, previous generations to current generations and a really good example of that is in boxing. Um, Muhammad Ali versus Mike Tyson, who wins that fight? We're getting to the point with generational adversarial networks where we can actually take 
Um, the attributes of Muhammad Ali, we can talk about his speed in the ring and everything that he sort of did by looking across his entire video footage and do the same with Mike Tyson and simulate what a fight might be between the two of them. So if you start to think about the impacts of that, um, there's some massive and major entertainment elements. Um, we could have movie stars of the past acting against movie stars of the future. And already we're starting to see that if you think of the latest films like Star Wars, where they were um, de-aging people like Mark Hamill or using Princess Leia after Carrie Fisher had died. And that's a use case where um, we've kind of been able to give back to the past a little bit. So there's a lot of other use cases that are quite interesting, but I think those two excite me the most in terms of what we might see in the entertainment lens because of these generation uh, models. Do you think that the Deezer solution was used in The Irishman? I think there was probably quite a bit of it used to, to de-age some of those actors there. Um, so the more of these techniques, it used to be someone that was sort of sitting um, at their screen for hours and doing photoshopping techniques. And much like that diagnosis in medicine, that's very time consuming. So to go back, and if you think of um, uh, Benjamin Button, I think was a film that actually had someone doing CGI on each frame. So now with the use of AI, you can kind of do that in real time and with processing power better than it's ever been. Um, and things like GPUs, we can do that really, really quickly. We can almost do that in real time just by supersetting the frame in there. So you think about the time savings that it's going to take in that industry. But I do believe, yeah, that the Irishman was using some of the AI technologies for that and not sort of traditional CGI technology. David, to conclude, uh, how will the company of the, of the future look like? In other words, do you believe that having a data science team is a must? I think we've already reached that stage. Um, if you think of the world's most successful companies and you think of the likes of Amazon or Tesla or Microsoft, companies that are driven by models and do what the models um, sort of organize in terms of evidence-based insights to help them move away from opinion-based insights are beating market averages. Um, there's been quite a lot of research and study by the likes of sort of Harvard to look into the impact of organizations that are utilizing models and algorithms. And on trend, it's about a seven to 10% increase in terms of their efficiencies and their ability to operate at scale. So I think we're at a stage now where as we've got far more data available to us, um, the rate of change in business is, is massive. So if you think of these global entities that are sort of um, popping up left, right and center, and how quickly we went from having Uber in a localized place like San Francisco to having it all across the world. All of these types of new trends means that we need to keep on top of things and we need to make decisions in a much faster cadence. And because of that, we, we sort of, we rely on data a little bit more. We rely on data science a lot more. So I, I think the companies of the now are very much data science centric, but potentially the new startups of the future are going to become data science general. So it's not just about having this as a function, but pretty much driven by the aspects of what AI and ML can do for them. I wonder if uh, one day I'll be substituted by a virtual journalist, which, are already, which is already existing, basically. Uh, David, thank you very much for your time and uh, good luck. Cheers. Thank you, Stefania. Goodbye.